Good evening. Welcome to Politics and Christianity. My name is Todd Lake. I'm Vice President for Spiritual Development at Belmont University. We're so glad you could join us for this special event as part of Belmont University's Ideas of America programming to support the October 22nd presidential debate on our campus. Won't that be interesting? Before we go any further, let me take a moment to thank our debate sponsors, particularly HCA Healthcare, the City of Nashville, the Nashville Convention and Visitors Corporation, and Ryman Hospitality Properties. We're so grateful to them and the many other sponsors that you'll find on the BelmontDebate2020.com website for making events like this possible. Our very special guest tonight is Dr. Lee C. Camp, whose book, A S uh, Scandalous Witness, A Little Political Manifesto for Christians, makes the case that a renewed Christian politics is more essential than ever, one that is neither left nor right nor religious, but a prophetic way of life modeled after Jesus of Nazareth. Christian identity is in moral and political crisis in our country, scandalized by the many ways in which it has been co-opted and misrepresented. Dr. Camp's robust vision challenges Christians to rethink who they are and how they participate in the political arena. Authentic gospel truth is a scandal to the American myth, he argues, and we're called to be scandalous witnesses. witnesses. Uh, I'll call him Lee because he is a friend of longstanding. Uh, Lee became a professor of theology and ethics after earning his PhD in moral theology and Christian ethics from the University of Notre Dame. He's published several books, including Mere Discipleship, Radical Christianity in a Rebellious World. He's also the host and creator of Token Show, a live event theological variety show that's taken place across the country as well as annually at the Ryman Auditorium right here in Music City. We are thrilled to have Lee Camp with us and we're now going to turn it over to him as he'll talk to us about a scandalous witness. Hello friends, I'm delighted to get to share with you and deeply grateful for this invitation from uh, Dr. Todd Lake and from Benita Walker from Larkin Briley, our friends there at Belmont University, and uh, grateful to get to participate with you in uh, this event for your pre-debate programming and grateful for the invitation. We find ourselves in this grave sort of circumstance, historically, socially, politically, and we find ourselves in a grave and challenging circumstance uh, based upon the, the current milieu in which we find ourselves for those of us who are Christians. Namely because that in many ways Christianity has begun to be seen as something like a bad public joke. That uh, regardless of the perspective from which others are looking at Christianity, it seems just to be in a bad place altogether. That we have sort of some sort of scandalized the witness, scandalized the nature of what it means to be Christian. Uh, for those who are secularists or those who on the left, the, the seeming uh, being captured by the right of, of white American evangelicalism is seen by secularists and those on the left as a deep sort of scandal and a mockery of the gospel of the poor, long-suffering Jesus. Similarly, those on the left might look at Christian progressivism and the way in which it is wrapped up in woke culture, the ways in which it is uh, caring about its own sort of mechanisms of perhaps shame or perhaps its sort of power. And those on the right might look at that and see that that form of Christian witness itself is also a scandal. But in any case, we find ourselves in this deeply problematic time, this deeply challenging time in which we desperately need to find a way into, to reconfigure the nature of Christian witness, to reconfigure the nature, nature of Christian political witness. There are some who suggest that um, in getting at Christian witness, in getting at the genius of Christianity, that we should insist that Christianity is not political. That is, they say that for us to be truly Christian, we must repeatedly emphasize the refrain, Christianity is not political. And I want to suggest from the start, that is a deeply flawed claim. As a matter of fact, I, I, would, I would suggest that that sort of claim is something like a modernist in pious clothing. 
This is a, a deeply flawed understanding of what Christianity is. Moreover, I would say it simply does not understand the most basic claims of what Christianity is. Christianity, I'm arguing uh, throughout this book, uh, Scandalous Witness, I'm arguing that Christianity is inherently political. Not that it merely has political implications, but that it is inherently political. Or, as I, as I use the phrase in the book, it is itself an alternative politic. However, in this intro introductory note, let me make sure I make clear from the start that in trying to recover the rightful notion that Christianity is political, we must avoid the notion that that means we can be reduced to some sort of partisan position on the right or on the left. So as I argue throughout the book, we need a Christian political witness that is neither right nor left, or also, as I add, nor religious. By religious, I mean Christianity must not be reduced to some sort of privatized notion of private spirituality that's merely about the afterlife, but that instead it is a politic. It's a concern with the realities of society. It's concerned with the realities of history that are thoroughly political, but again, neither right nor left. So tonight, in this, uh, in this lecture, I'm pleased to give you an overview of some of the themes, some of the propositions that I develop in the book. I will say that uh, we would love for you to come over. We just recently reduced, uh, re released a brand new online course that if you would like more resources or participate in the online course or would like to get a free copy of the book through the online course, please visit us over at leaseycamp.com and you get a lot more resources and access to that online course. But to the book. Um, in Christian orthodoxy, little o orthodoxy, in the great Christian tradition, I'm arguing in these propositions that we may find the resources then to find a rightful Christian political witness, even though it will be one that is scandalous to be sure, but scandalous in a way that's not scandalous like the right or the left today, but in an altogether more challenging, more beautiful, and more compelling sort of way. First, we must begin with a claim about history. Historians, in talking about uh, various forms of construing the meaning of history, suggest that there are some who think that history is just one damn thing after another. That is, there are some who believe that history is not going anywhere, that history is simply meaningless. That um, in, in, the, in the view of the, the so-called Mona Lisa of the 20th century entitled The Scream, which we might see as one representation of this, that when we look at history, overcome with its oppression, overcome with its injustice, it seems that all that we can do is simply to scream at the meaninglessness of it all, the existential angst that's exhibited by history, because it seems to be going nowhere and for no good purpose. But instead, Christians, Jews, and Muslims have always insisted that history is going somewhere, that history is the sort of stage upon which God is working the great drama of God's redemptive purposes. And it is going somewhere, namely, for the Christians and the Jews, the language of the Hebrew prophets, for example, it's going towards and headed toward new heavens and new earth in which all things will be made right. This itself is a historical and a political claim which we must always hold up first. But here's a second related terribly important corollary that Christians themselves particularly make. And that is this, that the end of history, the goal of history, where history is headed, has already broken into human history. It's already been inaugurated. That is, in the end, the final consummation of history, when all things are made right, when the blind will receive their sight, when the nations will learn war no more, when the dead will be raised, that this end, this goal of history, of justice, of righteousness, of all things being made right, has already been inaugurated in, in our midst, in the midst of human history. And that we now are receiving down payments of resurrecting power, down payments of where the world is headed through the power of God's Spirit, so that we may enact the end of history even now. This is seen, for example, in this picture, uh, in, uh, in the folk art of the Quaker Edward Hick in the early days of uh, the American experiment in which he used this language from the prophets about a lamb lying down with a lion and so forth as, as a way of representing the way in which 
the Quakers saw themselves as embodying, as living out this vision of a peaceable kingdom. They themselves, you see in the background of the picture, find themselves in council with the indigenous population, not seeing them as their enemies, but seeing them, as, as the Quakers would say, as their friends, as seeing the light of God in all people. And because of the possibility of being a peaceable people, they sought to enter into relationships as people who were bearing witness to the end of history, even in their own day. So history has a direction. And two, the end of history, the goal of history, the peaceable end of history is already broken into history even now. Here's a third and perhaps more problematic or provocative sort of claim that we have to grapple with. And that is this, to envision the nation state, to envision any nation state, not just the United States, but to envision any nation state then as the primary bearer of the salvific work of God in the world is to bastardize Christian hope. That is to try to take the notion of a nation state, again, any nation state, and try to wed it or bed it with Christian eschatological vision, with the Christian hope of where history is headed, is a bastardization of the beauty of the proclamation of the gospel. This has a long legacy in our own land. Uh, it has a long legacy of speaking in, in messianic, of speaking in salvific terms regarding the nation state. Go back, for example, to founding father Thomas Jefferson, who would speak of the United States as the world's best hope. Or you think, for example, about Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, who said that the United States and its form of government was the last best hope of earth. But this is not just a Republican thing. Again, it's important that we, we begin to see the ways in which this is a, uh, this is a common nonpartisan American conviction that stands at deep tension with the proclamation of basic Christian convictions. It's not just a Republican thing. So, for example, off on the left, we might say, uh, there's great messianic pretense among the, the Democratic president, Woodrow Wilson, himself a good Presbyterian. And presiding over the so-called Great War, World War I, he saw the making of war and the United States entering into the making of the so-called Great War as the war to end all wars. Remember, the notion of the end of war is the Jewish and the Christian vision of what God will do. Right? But here's Wilson saying, no, by our warring, we will bring about the end of all wars. Clearly, from our perspective now, quite naive. But nonetheless, it had this sort of messianic, salvific pretense to it, wedding it, the nation state, with the Christian eschatological vision. Or listen to this. In another speech, Wilson said this, I have lived to see a day in which, after saturating myself most of my life in the history and traditions of America, I seem suddenly to see the culmination of American hope and history, the sight of a great nation responding to and acting upon those dreams and saying, at last, the world knows America as the savior of the world. Well, I don't want to, again, left and right, another example from the so-called right. President Trump in his 2019 State of the Union address said, we must keep America first in our hearts and we must always keep faith in America's destiny that one nation under God must be the hope and the promise and the light and the glory among all the nations of the world. Note, again, the salvific messianic pretense of it. Or let's go back over to the left again with one highly prominent Democrat, Madeleine Albright, first female Secretary of State under President Bill Clinton, once said this regarding the war-making force of the United States. She said, if we have to use force, it is because we are America. We are the indispensable nation. We stand tall. We see further into the future. This sort of um, divinization of America, we might say, this sort of, again, messianic pretense given to the nation state uh, goes back, as we said, all the way 
many ways uh, to the founding fathers. But we can see this in the very central, the halls of power in Washington, D. itself. So if you go to the Capitol building, and there you see in the Capitol dome itself the so-called apotheosis of Washington, commissioned by Lincoln during the Civil War, in which at that time, of course, the Union itself was seen as a necessity for world history. The world apotheosis, which this painting is called the apotheosis of Washington, apotheosis means literally the raising of a person to the rank of a god or the glorification of a person as an ideal. And here you see George Washington himself in the apotheosis seated amidst the gods. Beneath Washington is the goddess Columbia and then Washington is flanked by female figures representing liberty and victory or fame. What I'm trying to suggest through all these examples is that uh, first a sort of critical diagnostic sort of capacity we must develop, train within ourselves. We must train ourselves to diagnose this sort of pretense. We must train ourselves with a critical eye to see the sort of messianic pretense. We must train ourselves to extricate ourselves from this theological captivity. Note, it's a theological captivity often of Christians' own making. And it must be stated clearly then, the United States is not the hope of the world. Instead, in the biblical witness, we have this long-standing tradition in which the Bible repeatedly, again and again and again, stands against imperialism. We have Pharaoh. We have the condemnations of Assyria, the calling to account of Babylon. We have in the New Testament Rome and its Herods and its Pilots strutting with pretense throughout the earth. And then, in the midst of that, in this climactic moment, and the, in, in the announcement of the coming of a Messiah is the song of Mary, in which Mary herself, pregnant with the Messiah, calls to account the mighty, calls to account the powerful, and says it will be the mighty who are brought down from their thrones. It will be the rich who go away hungry. It will be the poor who will be filled and who will be raised up. That at the center of it all is a critique of imperialist power. It's a critique of those who think they can strut through the earth and tell the world, tell the nations how things are going to be. This brings to mind, of course, the old uh, classic aphorism by Lord Acton, who's famously known for this phrase, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now this is, a, this is a phrase, a little bit of wisdom that um, the philosophers and the theologians uh, might want to take account in, in some very legitim legitimate sort of ways. But it's nonetheless a sort of conventional wisdom that points to our experience, human experience, that power does oftentimes corrupt and moreover that empires as they accumulate to themselves power, as they amass to themselves power, often overreach and in their overreaching there comes their own undoing precisely because of the corrupting possibilities of power. We find ourselves in our own day in which some would make the argument um, that perhaps the United States and its imperial conceits is already in its death pangs. Regardless of whether we accept this or not, regardless of what you might think of that claim, um, it's important to realize that to take a long view about imperialist power, to take a long view about the fact that the, that the Bible insists that all empires fall, that all empires will fall, and that the conceit of power corrupts and that the conceit of power, often we see the powers falling in on themselves because of such power. Uh, to, to take this sort of view is neither pe pessimistic nor is it unpatriotic. It's important that we be able to make this sort of objective critique without seeing it as being pessimistic, pessimistic or, a, or a hater, right? It doesn't indicate lo lack of love for one's country. It's sort of this sort of flat-footed biblical realism that broadens the possibilities for our socio-political posture in the world. If we will realize uh, that upholding any sort of partisan political agenda in an imperialist pursuit, a sort of uh, power for our nation state, we'll realize that that is inherently problematic and ultimately doomed to failure. Then all of a sudden we have different options and different possibilities for making more positive contributions to the world.
So let me just lay this very, very quickly, four subpoints here, right? One, if we recognize that Jesus explicitly rejected the so-called satanic imperialist shape for his kingdom. This was one of the temptations he rejects in the wilderness. Two, if we recognize that the long history of the Christian church precedes the United States empire. And three, if we recognize that the Christian church shall extend well beyond the life cycle of the United States, for this is the promise that Jesus made to Peter, right? Then four, we become free out of that matrix of convictions, we become free to be on the one hand both judge and critic, and at the same time contributor and citizen. Holding both of these things together, knowing that the existence of the U.S. empire is not our ultimate historical concern. Terribly important convictions that we must hold on to in the midst of all of this. There is, however, as we continue to fill this out, another sort of agenda that we often see in Christian political witness in our day that I think we need to learn to critique. And that is this, that the biblical values agenda that we often find, I want to suggest, is, is an unhelpful way of approaching, of, of construing or framing American political witness. That is, it's more like, um, I think, the practice of redaction. Let me, let me give you an example to show you what I mean by this. Redaction, of course, is taking some sort of text and blocking out parts that we might find problematic or that we don't want other people to read. So this is a, this is a silly example. Imagine this short narrative. This is how he said it, to which I strongly objected. You are an ass. You should be ashamed of yourself. Imagine taking that same text and redacting it very simply, just blocking out a few words. Now, all of a sudden, what this redaction does, this is how I strongly objected. You're an ass. You should be ashamed of yourself. This simple redaction has completely reversed the meaning of the text simply by pulling out some of the context, simply by pulling out some of the words. I'm using this as a somewhat silly or trivial example, though, of what often happens, I think, in the so-called biblical values work that often gets done in the public square. That many people think that what we must reduce, or what they have practically reduced Christian witness to, is pushing for certain so-called biblical values. But it's crucial that we as Christians realize that the Bible itself is this beautiful, complex, broad, compelling, winsome narrative. And if we go and pick out bits and pieces here and there and trot those out into the public square, we might be subverting the very basic meaning of the narrative itself. The narrative itself is full of many characteristics and traits, full of a, of a depiction of the particular ways in which God has sought to enter into human history. The way in which God, through Jesus of Nazareth, has entered into our midst as a servant, has entered into our midst as a humble one, has entered into our midst as one of skewing power, of loving enemies, of forgiving 70 times 7, of teaching us the long-suffering nature of love, and that it's through the long-suffering nature of love that the power of God is shown in the world. Not trotting out simple propositions, not trotting out certain simple biblical values, but a whole story out of which we are called to live. A related sort of thing uh, that we want to point to in this regard is the so-called long tradition of, of, of Constantinianism. Though we don't have time to talk uh, at length about this, but one of the, one of the great um, troubling manifestations of this came with, uh, with Charlemagne in the 8th century. And Charlemagne, and Charlemagne went to go and conquer the pagan Saxons, he, uh, the Christian king of the Franks. As he went to conquer them, for example, what he did was he took with himself a baptismal policy. He had one particular important, we might say, biblical value that he wanted to carry with him, that he did carry with him, and he set forward a baptismal policy. And it was this, you can either come be baptized or you can die. It's a simple choice. Accept this biblical value of baptism, and if you do not accept it, then you can die. But note that what's happening here with Charlemagne is the use of immense socio-political force, the use of military might, the use of the force of empire to propagate a so-called biblical value. And yet, because it ignores the broad expanse of the manner in which God in Christ has brought about God's good purposes in Jesus of Nazareth, then he's undercutting the very narrative 
which he purports to be supporting by his spread of this biblical value of baptism. Now, some might say, look, we know better than that, right? We're not, we're not medieval Christians. We know better than this sort of holding together such power with the gospel. Well, that's what some people say, but we might ask ourselves the question, well, but do we really know better, right? Because if one looks at the unfolding of the American experiment, of course, democracy and capitalism are also often seen as practices that must prevail. And they've often been seen as practices which warring was permissible then to spread democracy and capitalism. What we call the Cold War, for example, became a very hot war in Central America in service to these things. Or helping underwrite Pinochet as a dictator in Chile by some, some in the American American system, or the dropping of the atom bomb, which is seen as a way to set aside all sorts of norms and limits upon war because we had to win in this way in the name for some of a utilitarian calculus for American lives. But then we ask ourselves, um, is this the way to which we are called to participate in bearing witness to the so-called values, bearing witness to the practices of Christ. The whole of the biblical witness points us to different sorts of practices. Well, I want to move now to um, kind of begin to point us toward a more constructive, a, a few considerations for, the, for our constructive project. I've given us several considerations for things that we must diagnose, several things we might perhaps need to deconstruct. But let me point in, in very broad strokes here, because we only have time for very broad strokes, to point us toward a, a constructive task. I love this quote by uh, Dag Hammarskjöld, who was one of the most uh, well-known uh, secretary, uh, secretary generals of the United Nations in the 20th century. In his book, Markings, he has this beautiful line where he says, uh, your responsibility is a two. You can never save yourself by a not to. Right? Our job here is not to go about critiquing. Uh, there, there's places at which we must do critique. There's places at which we must do uh, the hard work of deconstruction, right? But in the end, that's not the goal. The goal is to describe what it is we are for, to describe what it is that we are striving to do and to be in the world. So in closing then, for this, uh, this sort of d constructive task, let me point back to the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 2, in days to come they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is just one of the many prophetic texts that points to uh, the, the hope of human history, the goal for where him, human history is headed. This apparently was a text that was uh, important to Dag Hammarskjöld himself, because when he uh, set up a meditation room at, at the UN, he, he has this, this text cited on the outside of the meditation room, but he and others who, who designed the meditation room there said that they didn't want any sort of religious symbolism in the room itself. But instead what they did is they took a six and a half ton block of iron ore that even today you can go see in the midst of the meditation room there in the UN. And look at this commentary from Hammerskald about that. He says, the material of the stone leads our thoughts to the necessity for choice between destruction and construction, between war and peace. Of iron, man has forged his swords. Of iron, he has also made his plowshares. Of iron, he has constructed tanks. But of iron, he has likewise built homes for man. The block of iron ore is part of the wealth we have inherited on this earth of ours. How are we to use it? The question that Hammerskjöld sets before us is the basic fundamental question of a politic. To what will we give ourselves? To what will we give our lives? To hostility? To all sorts of animosity? To all sorts of partisanship, which wrought at its worst is warfare? To what will we give ourselves? Was, will we give ourselves instead to the constructive work of God in the world? From a Christian perspective, what we might say then is that the Christian witness invites us to what we might call an ad hoc political witness. That is, rather than being any sort of proponent of an ideological position of right or left, rather than giving ourselves to some sort of utopian partisan position of right or left or any other sort of utopian partisan position, because we are a people who know that the kingdom of God has not yet come in fullness, because we thereby know that the power of brokenness in the world still can corrupt any 
political policy, any set of laws, any sort of political arrangement. We know that any one set up in its best purposes is soon to fall under the sway of the corruption of the power, to use the language of the New Testament, the power of sin. And therefore we need not, moreover should not, give ourselves to any partisan political agenda, but instead do the work that is set before us of dealing with whatever oppression is before us and finding ways of liberation to be brought to bear. To set ourselves before any injustice, whatever it might be, and find ways to bring about the work of justice in that context. To find any sort of context in which lies and the power of deceit is being employed and find ways to let our yes be yes and our no be no and the power of truth to be brought to bear. Holding with us all the resources of the biblical tradition, all the resources of the biblical narrative to bear upon that given situation and that given context. For what will we use the wealth of our lives, the wealth of your lives as college students, the wealth of, of our lives as we develop our vocations, the wealth of our lives in our communities, to the work of peaceableness, to the work of construction, or the work of destruction, and the work of animosity, and the work of partisanship. This is the fundamental root choice that we must make in our political witness in the world. With regard to all of this from Dag Hammarskjöld and Isaiah 2, there's a remarkable historical marker, a troubling historical marker, really, in Nashville, down on 8th Avenue, at the site of the Nashville Plow Works. Uh, the marker reads this, this way. Nashville Plow Works, site of a farm implement factory operated by Monsieur Sharp and Hamilton, previous to the war between the states. With the outbreak of hostilities, they reversed the biblical injunction and produced swords of excellent quality for the Confederacy. With the coming of the Federal Army, the making of swords was discontinued. We have in this sort of historical marker this remarkable acceptance that rather than holding on to the scandal of the gospel, namely of beating our swords into plowshares, whether we take that with, with, with direct reference to violence and nonviolence, or whether we take that in a more larger metaphorical broad sense for the notion of our work in the world, but here we have this particular instance where the biblical injunction itself gets turned on its head, that the scandal of the gospel is scandalized by turning it into something it was never intended to be. And so here in this day in which we find ourselves, with all sorts of animosity, all sorts of hostility, all sorts of political and social disturbance, we are called again to ask ourselves, how might we, rightfully bear witness to a new rightful scandal, which is actually, of course, a very old scandal, going back to the language of the Apostle Paul, that to find in the way of Christ the wisdom of God, which is a scandal to the powers that be, but nonetheless is the manner by which God has chosen to save the world. So again, I'm very grateful to have gotten to share with you uh, all of this material. Look forward to some dialogue and discourse with you. Again, if you want more, I would love for you to go over and join us on our online course where we're talking a lot more about this material. But in any case, I'm grateful again for the invitation and appreciative for your work in this regard and your participation. Lee, thank you so much for sharing with us. That was uh, brilliant and insightful and heartfelt. And just uh, can't, uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate your um, careful work in thinking through the biblical witness and then how it impacts us today. I want to invite those who are watching to uh, go to the uh, Q&A section and uh, put in some questions that you've got. Uh, maybe point of clarification. It may be something that you wish he'd had time to address, uh, but uh, Dr. Camp didn't, uh, maybe something that you're wrestling with in terms of politics and Christianity, and, and Lee can shed some light on that from his, his wide learning and deep thinking. So go to the Q&A function, put some questions in there, and we'll get to those right away. Lee, anything else you want to add before we go to the questions there? Uh, no, no, only uh, thanks to everyone's <laughs> patience. I, I covered a lot of uh, territory there in a uh, relatively quick fashion, uh, but I look forward to hearing any questions about uh, things I can help clarify or ways we can help uh, put some pragmatic points on any of this.
great. Well, uh, so insightful in terms of talking about imperialism of, of Babylon and Egypt and Rome and uh, America. Uh, here's a question that uh, uh, looks more domestically. Um, how does what you said about the nation state relate to addressing white Christian complicity in violence against Native and African Americans right here on American soil? Yeah, uh, I think that's a terribly helpful and important question. Um, I, I, um, I, I had a, a fairly um, moving experience here just of late in an interview I was doing with a um, Professor Willie James Jennings of uh, Yale Divinity School. Uh, Professor Jennings was at Duke for most of his career and been at Yale for the last five years or so. And he has a, a brilliant book out entitled The Christian Imagination, subtitled Theology and the Origins of Race. And one of the things that's remarkable about his book is that he's, he's doing uh, very deep critiques of imperialism and colonialism, which obviously I'm, I'm doing as well in, um, in this book and in other, other work I've done. But one of the things he traces out in that book is the ways in which the racist imagination that has predominated in the Western world goes back to the 15th century and Christian missions. And that as, um, as Christians from Europe went out into the world to discover the world, and as they're trying to make sense of cataloging the world and describing all that they're encountering, they use themselves, their white bodies, as a sort of originating way of cataloging things. And then they set up this sort of broad uh, spectrum from black to white, not just black Africans and white Europeans, but that everything, every people that they encounter gets laid out on this scale. And that at the root of all of it is this sort of racist superiority. And so I, I, I was just, um, I knew some of that, but I didn't know the depth and the literal cataloged nature of this sort of racist imagination. And so I think we continue to see the ways in which, um, the way in which Christians have allowed themselves to get caught up and to be complicit in various forms of imperialism or various forms of nationalism and the way in which that has directly been directly related to racism, I think is terribly important for us to continue to deconstruct that and then try to find constructive ways to bear witness to some other sort of way of the ways of reconciliation of Christ or the sort of way the Apostle Paul envisioned breaking down such hostilities and neither Greek nor Jew, male nor female, bond or free and the like. I think this next question will give you a chance to expound on what you were just, just saying okay. here. Does white American evangelicalism have anything to give or any resources available to it that can renew faithfulness to Jesus? Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that um, to, to the degree that those resources are found in being white, or, uh, whiteness in the sense of any sort of white supremacy, then no. Right. But to the degree that we trust this radical claim of Old and New Testament alike, uh, that God is long suffering with God's people and that God is always at work through God's spirit to bring about repentance and change. And that one of the most radical exhibitions of the grace of God is that even in our failures, even in our rebellion, God continues to bring about renewal in our midst. I think that's where we have to look for the sorts of resources for uh, possibility and renew, po you know, renewal for uh, redemptive purposes in, in the world. Here's a fiery question. You'll like this. Oh, good. <laughs> Said, I agree with being nonpartisan. I also observe biblical prophets naming the evil of the kings. Yeah. Why are U.S. ministers and pastors so reluctant to critique an obviously evil king, a.k.a. U.S. president, actually are quite celebratory? Yeah. Well, I, I think that there's all sorts of place for that. Um, and I think that, um, you know, when, when we have lying, patent lying happening, we should say that's, that's patently a lie. Uh, when we have patent uh, celebration or, or refusal, for example, to denounce white supremacy, we should say, uh, that's, this is highly, highly problematic and uh, deeply troubling. Uh, so in my mind, that's, that by no, in no way is that sort of public witness um, off, off the, off the ranch, we might say, you know, definitely 
uh, we should certainly speak out to that. And that's one of the things that I try to do in the book is, is talking about um, sectarianism as, as I'm using it in the book or partisanship as I'm using it in the book is this sort of ideological commitment to one side over against the other. Um, and and so, a, so a sectarian can only see good in their side and only see evil in the other. Um, or the sectarian on this side can only see good in their side and only see evil in the other side. But if we take this sort of Christian ad hoc approach that I'm arguing for, I'm suggesting that um, we ought to be able to step aside from that sort of partisanship, that sort of sectarianism, and we, we must prepare ourselves to be um, critic of wickedness where we see it, and we must prepare ourselves to celebrate goods where we see them. Uh, and so if we, that we ought to be able, I think, in my mind as Christians, we ought to be able to see some of the grave historic failings of the American right, and we ought to say these are grave historic failings and repentance is required. Similarly, uh, on the left. And then there are things about the right that we ought to be able to celebrate. And there are things about the left that we ought to be able to celebrate. Uh, and let me just give you one quick example so it's not quite so, quite so abstract. You know, I think, I think, for example, about the notion of power. You know, stereo, and again, I'm speaking stereotypically with very broad strokes here, but I think there's, there's truth to this. Um, it, it, it's always confused me that uh, the right, for example, uh, will be so suspicious of power in the federal government uh, in theory, the suspicions of power in the federal government, and yet not have that same sort of suspicion of power in global capitalism. And it just blows my mind. It's like, look, you're right to be afraid of and to speak out against overreaching bureaucratic power of federal government or any sort of government. Of course, we should be cautious about that. But why not be just as cautious about that and, and disturbed by that, by the power of global corporations, which in many ways we've given our Free, given our rights over to, in many ways, by the, by the spying that is done on us by global corporations. Um, and so similarly with the left, I think we have to learn to have these sort of equal opportunity celebrations and critiques on a variety of issues. So by no means do I want to suggest by the things I've said tonight that we should not be speaking out. Of course we should. But, but I, I think that it's indispensable that we learn to do that from this different set of convictions as opposed to doing it from ideological partisan positions. Wonderfully, wonderfully said. We should, we should speak out, but we shouldn't sign up for an agenda that is predetermined for us by a political, political party. Um, I'm gonna take three questions here. We're getting a lot of questions, Lee. That's, that shows the kind of uh, interest that you engendered in, in, in those who are watching tonight. Uh, so I'm gonna give you three of them and you can kind of put them together, okay. I think. Um, uh, first, um, from our own Benita Walker. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation. How do I reconcile your comments in dealing with racism? As a Christian, I'm struggling with this and how to address this narrative. And then a, a related question, how is it so many evangelicals support white supremacists in high public office? We can stand by for that answer. And uh, finally, um, let me get this last one there, third one, there we go. Uh, the white church is, was sadly quiet during slavery and the civil rights struggle. History is repeating itself as the church is quiet, as immigrants are caged, healthcare is denied, the plight of the poor is ignored. H how do we change? Yeah. So there's a lot there, yeah. but in in, in some right. space. Yeah, I, I and I I too celebrate the utter failure of so many white churches um, with regard to all of these things. And again, I I, I certainly want to reiterate again. Um, I, I hope it's clear from what I said that by no means am I advocating any sort of quietism or or being passive in light of these things. Um, you know, in, in my mind, um, the, there has been in, in American history, uh, going back to sorts of individualistic, otherworldly visions of Christianity, uh, this sort of notion that somehow the gospel doesn't have anything to say about racism. And I think that is terribly flawed and terribly problematic and, and it, to be denounced as, as, a, as a perversion of Christian faith and practice. Um, and it, but if you, you know, if you, you go back to and this is one thing I'm trying to say about the political nature of Christianity, right? When, when we go back to look at somebody like the Apostle Paul, and he takes the great dividing categories of his day, uh, male and female, 
Greek and Jew, a bond or free. And he says, in Christ, the, the power of these things is broken down. He, he, is, he, in other words, is giving us a picture of something like the practice of baptism that brings us into Christ as a inherently political practice. It is a commitment to a different politic altogether. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a, bold, a bold, bright line to be drawn from the Apostle Paul's vision in the first century to, to our sort of witness where we must denounce any form of racism and any form of white supremacy. And if we're refusing to do it, we're refusing the most basic tenets of the gospel. Uh, and, and I think until we realize that, I don't think that we've understood what Christianity is. Um, and so I, I think that these are, these, all of these things are very much at the heart of uh, what we're trying to get at in this sort of description that I'm trying to give of Christianity. Very good. We are in no way going to have a chance to get to all these great questions that are coming in. So I'm trying to pick ones that are representative of, of a number of questions. But thanks for all of you who've asked questions. If you have one to shoot in there, don't, don't hesitate to do that, even as we're, we're going to wrap up in about another eight or nine minutes here. Um, but this, this gets to a core question that's being asked. How should we as Christians respond to the hatred and violence that's facing our country today? Should we join in with BLM protests, Black Lives Matter protests and riots, or do we speak, support, and stand on the sidelines? Yeah, um, I think that um, I think that we find some sort of way always to try to speak to bear witness to the truth. And um, I, in my mind, that may be best done in to figuring out the way we do that in our given context, in my mind, uh, and in my try to in my practice, it, to let that be done in local contexts of discernment. Um, I mean, I've, I was, um, uh, went to, I, I participated in Black Lives Matter March uh, two years ago in Nashville, and I'm glad I did. Um, I, I think too that um, the, the question always becomes so in what ways, what, what are we communicating by such things, right? And we're, th that, the fact that I just said that is gonna communicate different things to different people who heard that, right? But, um, and, and certain people will, will portray it as something that it's not. Um, but in any case, uh, what it is, you know, it's, it's an attempt on my part and an attempt. In, and, I, and I did that because I had other people ask me, invite me, please, will you come into this space with us? And I thought this is the right, th right thing for me to do in this context. Um, and then there were others who were, were troubled by that because they, they, they're looking at the, the platform of the Black Lives Matter movement and say there's certain things about the Marxism or whatever that, you know, how could you do that? Uh, but, but, but the point I think is always that I'm trying to make is that I think we always have to be seeking to bear witness to the truth the best we know how in the context in which we find ourselves. Um, and that will look differently for different people in different times and different places. Uh, you know, one of, one of the four cardinal virtues, going back to Aristotle and then picked up with, Tom, with Thomas Aquinas, of course, is it, it's, it's courage, prudence, temperance, and justice. Um, and, and I think when we were working at trying to hold all four of those things together, the context is going to uh, inform perhaps different ways that we might do that in different contexts. Great. Uh, good question here from Olivia Mellon. Uh, what are the kinds of practices that can form Christians into living out the kind of radical politic you describe? Hmm. Hello, Olivia. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that, um, I, I, I guess, I don't know the, the best way to answer that. I, th I think for myself, uh, in addition to some of the things I try to describe in the book, um, for myself as a person, as an individual in the context I'm in, some of the additional practices that I don't talk about in the book that might be getting at your question would be things like trying to, to listen and listen widely to a lot, lots of different people, especially to people um, on the margins, and especially to people who might not have uh, power, um, and to pay attention and to, to le learn to have good conversations. 
So reading, having good conversations, listening, being open to people, inviting me in to see things in a different way, being open even to rebuke, rebuke as unpleasant as that is. Um, you know, we've learned, I've learned a lot from people who've been angry with me and have said, no, you're just not seeing that right. And you need to learn to see that in a different way. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think too, I go back to the four cardinal virtues. I think, I think us learning to exercise courage uh, and to speak up in the context in which we find ourselves. If, if we suspect that the gospel is pointing us in a given direction and we find ourselves in the context in which we find ourselves, people simply ignoring gospel wisdom, then I think the courage uh, is key, right? And the courage to learn how to speak up in our context and ask a hard question or to say something that's going to be difficult to be heard. Um, I, I think, again, these are key practices that we just have to continue to cultivate in ourselves. It's never easy and it's always hard work. Um, mm -hmm. but, but a part, I think, of what we've, what we've signed up for, if, we've, if we have signed up for Christian discipleship, I think those are things we have signed up for. Well, this, uh, this next question um, is, is a little long and in some ways it's asking, and well, I'll put it up there for you, um, but in, in some ways it's asking, uh, do we really want to wind up having to say there are good people on both sides? Mm. Um, you know, that uh, says political witness can be ad hoc, but sometimes those ad hoc judgments overwhelmingly line up with peace and justice and rights rather than greed and violence. MLK didn't mince words about those who chose to stay above partisan politics. And we know what the reference is there, the letter from a Birmingham jail, instead of working to achieve civil rights for black folks. You have to choose a side sometime, right? Liberation from oppression necessitates choosing the side against the oppressor. And of course, in our country, which is not a parliamentary democracy, uh, you, you basically have two choices, you know, when you have mm -hmm. a presidential election and even local elections, it tends to be Democrat, Republican, um, and is there a danger here in, um, in mincing words? Right. Well, I, I, I deeply appreciate the question. And I think that's a terribly uh, helpful and important question. Um, and my short answer to the question, sometimes you have to choose a side. You have, you have to choose a side sometime, right? And I would say, yes, of course. Um, however, I, I would also want to note that what choosing a side means might not be so obvious as our questioner might assume. I don't know what the mm -hmm. questioner does assume there, but wh what does it mean to choose a side, right? Do, do we mean by that wh who you're going to vote for? Um, and, and if that's what we mean, then I would say, yeah, you know, I'm going to go choose who I'm going to vote for, and I'm going to do it based upon my understanding of the whole biblical narrative and the whole biblical witness and trying to put this stuff into practice, and I'm going to go choose a side, you know, if, if, when I vote. But I, I the, the larger thing that I think we have to see here is that if we take this vision of Christianity as a politic, then voting is, is only one small matter in the life of a Christian politic. Uh, it has some significant, terribly significant implications that we should never take lightly. Uh, but, but the whole notion here is that there, um, you know, there are all sorts of ways to choose a side, to work on behalf of justice, to work on behalf of peace, to work on behalf of, of goods. And, if, and similarly, there's all sorts of ways to undercut or to choose against things like greed and choose against things like violence. And so I don't want to have too narrow of a vision of what it might mean to choose the side, but instead have a much more expansive vision about what it might mean to sow the seeds of the kingdom of God in all of these categories in the world in which we find ourselves. Well, I wish we could get to more questions, but we're going to wrap things up here. I can't thank you enough for uh, the light you've shed on a very tough set of uh, issues that face us as Christians who are inevitably making political decisions. And as you pointed out in this last answer, uh, in our day-to-day -day decisions, in our week-to-week -week, uh, choices about with whom we associate, where we spend our money, our time, our uh, where we invest our lives in terms of our careers. So thank you so much for, for casting a broad vision for what it is to, to be a Christian in a politically charged world. Yeah, uh, thank me, you uh, very much. I, I'm appreciative of the invitation and uh, grateful to you all for uh, participating with us and the immensely good questions. And I, I'm sorry that we didn't have time to get to, to more of them, but thank you all.
Yeah, the more the more uh, the more you speak, the more good questions uh, arise, of course. And there's just so many different ways. Uh, but you've certainly started us down a very fruitful path here. Any last words you'd like to say before we close out? No, just um, may God grant us wisdom and discernment and courage, prudence, temperance, and justice, and faith and hope and love as we seek to sow the seeds of the kingdom of God. Uh, blessings on you all, and thank you all. That's wonderful. Let me let me close out our time in prayer. God, thank you so much for calling us together this evening. Uh, we want to be on mission for you. And God, we do not want to be beholden to uh, an ideology or a political party. Uh, we certainly don't want to be uh, held captive uh, by um, a racial superiority uh, or uh, take advantage of uh, uh, privilege or rest easy with oppression. God, we want to be uh, about our Father's business, just as Jesus was during his time on earth. Uh, God, we want to listen to the prophets in the Old Testament, and we want to be as brave as the apostles in the New Testament, uh, willing to say that uh, Jesus is Lord of all, that our citizenship is in heaven, and that uh, we expect to see justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And God, we don't want to settle for anything less and we certainly don't want to backslide into selfish tribalism and uh, protecting um, what we've got. Uh, but we want to be people who show the love of Christ and reach across uh, the, the, the high walls that have uh, been erected in our society, dividing uh, people into socioeconomic and racial groups and then across our world. Um, uh, where uh, one nation can view itself as better than another, as, as Lee pointed out in his talk. God, thank you for this chance to be inspired, uh, to make uh, a difference for Christ during our brief time together on earth, that his kingdom might come and will might be done here. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. Thank you so much. Thanks thank again, you. Dr. Camp. Really Thanks, appreciate Tom. it.